From New York, this is Democracy Now! I generally have no optimistic impression that I can report to you from this conversation with President Putin. The offensive in eastern Ukraine is evidently being prepared on a massive scale, which is why I made very clear that stable access for the International Red Cross is needed. After a meeting with Vladimir Putin, Austria's chancellor warns Russia is planning a massive offensive in eastern Ukraine. We'll speak with the Ukrainian-American journalist Lev Galenkin. He's from Kharkiv, Ukraine's second city, which has been under heavy Russian shelling. Then we'll look at how a fund led by the Saudi Crown Prince has invested $2 billion in a new private equity firm run by Donald Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. The news comes as Turkey suspends the trial of 26 Saudis accused of assassinating journalist Jamal Khashoggi and sends the trial to Saudi Arabia at the kingdom's request. We'll get the latest. Finally, Pandemic Inc. chasing the capitalists and thieves who got rich while we got sick. The focus of the book is on the people who saw an opportunity in our vacuum of leadership and our lack of preparedness to make money and, and get rich at the cost of of our pandemic response and, and our community. We'll speak to investigative reporter J. David McSwain. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Austria's leader met Monday with Russian President Vladimir Putin, warning after his visit to Moscow, Russia is set to intensify the brutality of its assault on Ukraine. Chancellor Karl Nehmer said he spoke with Putin for about 75 minutes, becoming the first European leader to meet with Putin since Russia invaded Ukraine in late February. This comes as Ukraine's government says tens of thousands of Russian troops are massing for a major new offensive in eastern Ukraine aimed at capturing the entire Donbass region. On Monday, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, addressed South Korea's parliament, asking for military aid. Zelensky also said the death toll in the besieged city of Mariupol was far higher than previously reported. Mariupol, Mariupol has been destroyed. There are tens of thousands dead. But even despite this, the Russians are not stopping the offensive operation. They want to make Mariupol a demonstratively destroyed city. Zelensky's claims could not be confirmed, as Mariupol remains largely cut off from the outside world. On Monday, Mariupol's mayor told reporters more than 10,000 civilians have died in the city. Meanwhile, the Pentagon says it's monitoring unconfirmed reports that Russian troops used chemical weapons during the assault on Mariupol. In Russia, police arrested the prominent anti-war activist and opposition politician Vladimir Karamurza on unknown charges Monday, after he called the Russian government a regime of murderers. Karamurza previously survived two suspected poisonings that rights groups blamed on Russia's Federal Security Service. The United Nations says it's investigating reports of sexual violence and rape committed by Russian troops in Ukraine. Sima Bahus, the executive director of UN Women, spoke Monday to the UN Security Council. The combination of mass displacement with the large presence of conscripts and mercenaries and the brutality displayed against Ukrainian civilians has raised all red flags. Bahus also warned of increasing risks of human and sexual trafficking of young women and unaccompanied teenagers. Her comments came as human rights worker Katerina Cherapaka testified her organization has documented nine cases of rape by Russian soldiers involving 12 women and girls, something she called just the tip of the iceberg. We know that many of these cases will hardly or even never be disclosed, unfortunately, as many of those suffered are killed already by Russian invaders. We know and see, and we want you to hear our voices, that violence and rape is used now as a weapon of war by Russian invaders in Ukraine. 
Sweden's ruling Social Democrats said Monday they'll review their long-standing policy of military non-alignment after some lawmakers demanded Sweden apply for NATO membership. This comes after Finnish leaders said they're considering a plan to end Finland's long-standing neutrality policy in order to join NATO. In Moscow, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov warned NATO against the inclusion of Sweden in Finland. We've repeatedly said that NATO remains a tool geared towards confrontation. It's not the kind of alliance that ensures peace and stability, and its further expansion will not bring additional security to the European continent. Earlier this year, Swedish and Finnish soldiers joined about 30,000 NATO troops in northern Norway near the Russian border for Arctic war games, known as Operation Cold Response. China's COVID-19 crisis deepened Monday as authorities announced plans to test 18 million people in the city of Guangzhou, northwest of Hong Kong. Officials sealed off the city to most new arrivals and canceled in-person classes for schoolchildren after officials detected just 27 coronavirus cases on Monday. This comes amidst growing popular protests against a sweeping lockdown in Shanghai, where some 26 million people have been confined to their homes for up to three weeks, sometimes without access to food or medicine. Some parents report they spent days separated from young children who tested positive for coronavirus. Here in the United States, Philadelphia has become the first major city to reinstate an indoor mask mandate after a sharp rise in new COVID-19 cases. The move comes just six weeks after Philadelphia officials dropped indoor mask requirements put in place amidst record rates of infection last winter. Meanwhile, several prominent U.S. universities, including Columbia, Georgetown, Johns Hopkins and Rice, have reinstated mask mandates on campus. The number of U.S. infections is once again rising, led by northeastern states, where the BA2 Omicron subvariant has become the dominant form of coronavirus. Israeli forces have killed six Palestinians, including two women and a teenager, since Friday. In one incident, Israeli soldiers shot dead an unarmed Palestinian mother of six, who they claimed did not heed calls to stop at an Israeli checkpoint near Bethlehem in the occupied West Bank. Tension has been soaring in recent weeks between Israelis and Palestinians. 14 people have died in Israel in attacks by Palestinians over the past three weeks. Israel's responded by raiding Palestinian neighborhoods in the West Bank, setting up makeshift military checkpoints and conducting mass arrests. The Israeli Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, who recently lost his parliamentary majority, said, quote, the state of Israel has gone on the offensive. In news from Egypt. An economic researcher has died in custody after being forcibly disappeared in February. Eman Hadoud died in early March, but his family only learned of his death this weekend when they were asked to collect his body from a psychiatric hospital in Cairo. Hadoud helped found the Liberal Reform and Development Party in Egypt. On Monday, his brother was summoned for questioning. Meanwhile, the imprisoned Egyptian activist Ala Abdel Fattah has become a British citizen in a bid to increase pressure on authorities to release him. The prominent human rights activist has spent most of the past decade locked up. Back in the United States, a former police officer in Virginia has been convicted on six counts for his role in the January 6th insurrection. Thomas Robertson had served as a police officer in Rocky Mount, Virginia. A month prior to the insurrection, Robertson called for a, quote, open armed rebellion. He is the second January 6th defendant to be convicted by a jury. The White House has finalized a new federal rule that would regulate ghost guns more like regular guns. Ghost guns are firearms without serial numbers that are usually assembled from kits and often sold over the Internet or created in 3D printers. The Justice Department reports about 6,000 such guns are recovered at crime scenes each year. President Biden announced a new regulation Monday at the White House, where we was joined by Mia Tretta, a survivor of the Saugus High School shooting in Santa Clarita, California, in 2009. 19, Tretta was shot in the stomach by a teenage classmate in an attack that killed her best friend, 14-year-old Dominic Blackwell. Dominic had died, and so had another classmate, Gracie Ann Muehlberger, a 15-year-old girl with an infectious laugh. And a community was left shattered. 
I later learned that we had been shot by a 16-year-old student for reasons I will never know. He had brought his father's weapon to school, a firearm I would come to know as a ghost gun. Ghost guns are untraceable, build-it-yourself firearms that look like a gun, shoot like a gun, and kill like a gun, but have not been regulated like a gun. Biden's new rule does not ban sales of ghost gun kits. Instead, it would mandate serial numbers for weapons parts, as well as a background check for buyers. Meanwhile, President Biden's nominated former U.S. attorney Steve Dettelbach to head the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and Explosives. Biden's previous pick, David Chipman, failed to win the support of three Senate Democratic caucus members and withdrew his nomination amidst attacks from Republicans and the NRA over his gun control advocacy. The Senate it's confirmed just one permanent director in the last 16 years amidst heavy lobbying from gun advocacy groups. State lawmakers in Maryland have voted to expand abortion access, becoming the 15th state to allow health professionals other than doctors to carry out the procedure. The new law provides funds for abortion care training programs and allows nurse practitioners, midwives and physicians' assistants to become certified to perform abortions. The bill became law after Maryland's House of Delegates and state Senate voted to override a veto of the legislation by Republican Governor Larry Hogan. And Indonesia's parliament has approved a landmark bill aimed at preventing sexual violence. The new legislation provides prison terms of up to 12 years for crimes of physical sexual abuse, both in and out of marriage, and criminalizes forced marriage and online sexual harassment. It also sets up trust fund and recovery services to help survivors of sexual violence. Women's rights groups spent six years campaigning for the legislation. Outside Indonesia's parliament, police fired tear gas and water cannons to clear hundreds of students who rallied Monday to protest high prices for staples like cooking oil. The students are also demanding that the Indonesian president, Joko Widodo, back away from a proposal that he extend his tenure beyond the two terms in office allowed under Indonesia's constitution. We are protesting the extension period for the president's tenure and the increasing price of oil and many other things that are hurting people. What's clear is how the elites are forcing themselves to delay the election, and that's what hurts the Constitution. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Austria's chancellor, Karl Nehmer, met with Vladimir Putin in Moscow Monday, becoming the first European leader to meet with the Russian president since the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The chancellor said he fears Putin will intensify the brutality of the war as Russia launches a major offensive in eastern Ukraine. I generally have no optimistic impression that I can report to you from this conversation with President Putin. The offensive in eastern Ukraine is evidently being prepared on a massive scale, which is why I made very clear that stable access for the International Red Cross is needed. Thousands of Ukrainians have been fleeing eastern Ukraine ahead of the Russian offensive, but many are afraid to leave by train after a missile attack on a train station in the Ukrainian city of Kramatorsk killed at least 57 people and wounded at least 100. The crowded train station was packed with civilians trying to flee the area. UNICEF says nearly two-thirds of Ukraine's children have been displaced by the fighting. Earlier today, Russian President Vladimir Putin defended his decision to invade Ukraine, saying it's needed to protect Russian-speaking people in eastern Ukraine. Putin said, quote, its goals are absolutely clear and noble. It's clear we didn't have a choice. It was the right decision, he said. We're joined now by Lev Golenkin. He is a Ukrainian-American journalist who's reported extensively on Ukraine for years, the author of A Backpack, A Bear, and Eight Crates of Vodka, A Memoir of Soviet Ukraine. His article in The New York Times last month was headlined, The Ukraine of My Childhood is Being Erased. He came to the U.S. as a child refugee from the eastern Ukrainian city of Kharkiv. It was Kharkov in 1990. Lev Golenkin, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us, but under terrible circumstances. Can you talk about your city, uh, Ukraine's second largest, the city of Kharkiv in the east, and what's happening right now? Hi. 
The city is, uh, I mean, it basically is in a siege mentality. The mayor says uh, things are, people are remaining calm, but there's only so much calm you can have. There's been so much just not only bloodshed, but symbolic uh, attacks. For example, uh, a Holocaust memorial outside the city where uh, the Nazis killed 15,000 Jews in just a space of two days uh, has been bombed. And the memorial has been damaged. Uh, the synagogue that was shut down there at the time that I was uh, living there, the Soviets shut down the synagogue. They they tamped down on all religion and cultural life. And now uh, there's stories of it being shelled. So once again, here's Moscow shutting it down with violence. And it's just, it's, uh, and, and bear in mind, this is the city where the overwhelming majority of the population is, like I am, uh, primarily and originally Russian-speaking. These are Russian-speaking Ukrainians. These are the people that Putin's saying he's going to be saving. And they're either, they've either fled and are refugees, or a lot of them, the, uh, the elderly, the disabled, the poor, uh, the sick, they're the ones who are staying behind. And these are the people who are now in terror of what Putin is saying is a liberation. So talk more about that, because I don't think people quite understand. Like I said, you uh, grew up in Kharkov, uh, which is called Kharkiv right now, and that Putin is saying he's saving um, the Russians in Ukraine. Talk about how many of the fur of people who actually their first language is Russian in Ukraine. In fact, the president, um, uh, his first language was Russian. He is an ethnic Russian. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even, I don't even know. It's very hard to compare the difference between ethnic Russian and ethnic Ukrainian. Um, there's a lot of intermix in the eastern Ukrainian part of it. But put it this way, they, these people are citizens of Ukraine. They were born in Ukraine. Russian happens to be their primary language, much like people in Canada who uh, speak French and who are Canadian citizens. And uh, these are the Russian speakers that Putin is saying that are currently being oppressed and that he's liberating. And Amy, the, the problem with this narrative, and this is what's leading me to a rather dark uh, area, is that Putin needs this victory. He is saying that these people in eastern Ukraine, they are our brothers, they are our Russian speakers, and they are being oppressed and held in this in Ukraine, and we are liberating them. The notion of that was that people would open the open the city gates and welcome everybody and welcome the Russians with flowers. They're not doing that at all because, of course, they're being bombed. Why would they be welcoming anybody who's bombing them? So the problem then becomes from Putin's narrative, which is these people are our brothers and they're waiting for us to save them. And then why aren't they, why aren't they celebrating being saved? Why aren't they rejoicing? And the explanation that they've been coming up with on Russian propaganda websites and on Russian media is that the people in eastern Ukraine, the ones that are supposed to be being saved, they've actually been brainwashed by Russia and by, uh, by um, America and by George Soros and by Western Ukrainian nationalists. So these people, um, now the story is that they're being, they've been brainwashed and they need to be cleansed, with cleansed being the uh, operative word here. That opens you up to a whole new level of war crimes, because people, it's hard to justify bombing people who are supposed to be your brothers and sisters. But now that you're talking about these people who've been brainwashed, who now pose a danger, now that opens up a whole lot of possibilities that are terrifying, because the, the construction of this now is that these people uh, can be killed, which is exactly what they're doing. So, if you can talk about the war crimes now alleged on both sides, Russian and Ukrainian. Please understand this. As somebody who's been following this, Russia didn't start this war crimes now. Over the past eight years, the people of Donbass, the industrial heart of Ukraine, have been the victims of, bomb crime, uh, of war crimes on both sides. Both sides have used cluster bombs. Both sides have used uh, uh, 
grad missiles which are basically just just have no they'll just go up and they'll just fall over a population they're not they're not aimed at anybody and they just kill people uh both sides have uh, unleashed gangs of psychopaths that have been raping have been torturing have been withholding supplies have been blocking food from areas so uh russia is right now committing a ton of, I mean, the entire invasion is a war crime. It's like, it's talking about specific ones. It's actually really just all, of, none of this would be happening if Russia didn't invade. So the whole, the, the primary invasion, that's the war crime here. And, but just understand that there's just been horrors committed and often very quietly on both sides. For example, uh, Donbass is now one of the most, if not the most heavily landmined area in the globe, on the globe. And this is just, this is incredible. Like people just don't understand, but this is, both sides have been spreading mines everywhere without leaving maps. And villagers on either side of the of the conflict have just been blown up quietly over the past eight years. You just hear a report here, a report there, but it's just, it's millions of people who've been, who've had their lives destroyed uh, between this fighting. So, Lev Galenkin, you keep talking about over the past eight years. Let's talk about the history. As it becomes clear, the Austrian chancellor, you know, meeting with Putin uh, for over an hour and coming out and saying, it's going to be brutal, we can't stop this, it's going to be in the East, and it didn't just take him saying this. Um, talk about the last eight years. For people who don't understand the Donbass, what it means, why it's distinct from the rest of Ukraine. The people of Donbass have more in common with Western Pennsylvania and Ohio than they do with Moscow or Kiev or Washington or anybody else. It's they they are proud to be miners. They're industrial. They are uh, steel workers. They are, um, you know, you could tell a lot by what people call their sports teams. You know, there's certain places in America where you would have the Steelers, the Packers. And that's that's in places where such uh, such occupations are very valued and where they're seen as honorable occupations. And it's the same thing. Like I mean, my my city Kharkiv, the 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 soccer team is called Metal East, the metal workers. You know, Don Donetsk is Shakhtar, the miners. So the, these are people who didn't have a problem with anybody and would rather have just been left alone and uh, just being able to work. That's pretty much all they wanted. They, they have very little to do with either Kiev or Moscow or anybody else. Um, there's been an insurrection there since 2014 where um, the Maidan uprising that started, that was in the winter of 2013, 2014, resulted in the ouster of Yanukovych, who was the elected president. And he was a president elected by Eastern Ukrainians, people like in the Donbass, people in Crimea. Uh, after he was ousted, uh, there was a lot of unrest because he was their president. He might he was he was a spectacularly corrupt politician, but he was their spectacularly corrupt politician. So there was a lot of unrest. Russia fed into that unrest and provided weapons, provided soldiers, provided uh, uh, guides. And uh, this, in turn, led to an uprising in Donbass. Ukraine, who, which already lost its territory because Russia seized Crimea, uh, went to suppress the uprising. And from that point on, Donbass, this industrial, uh, industrial heartland, turned into—I mean, if you look at it, it just turned into the, an apocalyptic wasteland, with both sides just funneling psychopath mercenaries with funneling weapons, bombs, mines, and just destroying the entire area. And what's been extraordinarily frustrating for me is I would watch uh, Russian media, I would look at that, and the Russian media would be weeping about the horrible things that Kiev is doing. And I would look at Ukrainian media, and Kiev would be weeping about the horrible things that Russia is doing. And it's like, bo on a daily basis, both sides have just decimated these people of Donbass while simultaneously pretending to care about the welfare of the people of Donbass. OK, let's talk about Azov for a minute once again, um, this battalion within the Ukrainian National Guard. You know, sometimes you can watch CNN, for example, and in the upper right, uh, when they're showing video B-roll of destruction, 
It says Azov. And I was wondering if you can explain what this battalion is and what role it's playing right now in places like Mariupol um, uh, and other areas in the east. Sure. Um, it was formed out of uh, several neo-Nazi gangs in uh, the time of the Maidan uprising, when the separatists in Donbass, when the Russian-backed separatists rose up, Ukraine didn't have an army. It basically, the army was decimated after two decades' worth of corruption. Uh, I think there were something like 6,000 soldiers, that's it. Like, the New Jersey National Guard has more. Um, the people who stepped forward to fight were the radicals. They're always the ones who are the most prepared to kill and the most prepared to die. Azov was the battalion that was formed out of there. And it became one of the battalions, one of the far-right battalions that started fighting on behalf of Kiev. And uh, pretty soon it acquired a record of war crimes, it acquired a record of uh, violence, um, and also of attracting far-right figures. Uh, they're extremely effective, they're extremely well organized, they have a wonderful propaganda wing that whitewashes them. And um, But they are neo-Nazi, they use neo-Nazi symbols, their division, if you look at their insignia, it's uh, it's modeled after um, several neo-Nazi uh, uh, symbols, ones that have been seen in Charlottesville. Um, this is a battalion that should not be, the, uh, the news organization should not be using them. They, this is, uh, it's... All it does is, A, play into Russian propaganda, and B, it gives them uh, legitimacy, which they absolutely should not be getting because they are white supremacists. And it's it's shameful to see news organizations use videos from Azov. It was shameful the Financial Times actually uh, interviewed the leader of Azov, who is a committed neo-Nazi, and they gave him a platform. And it's been extremely disturbing to see these this group being legitimized. Japan just took them off the list of their terrorism. They have a they have a list of terror groups, and they and then they, they just took them off the list. And I mean, I cannot stress this enough: support Ukraine, support the people who are not white supremacists. That's the overwhelming majority of Ukraine. Do not support this formation. Do not support it because they are white supremacists. They are wonderful for Putin's propaganda, and they are seeking to get international fighters to come to Ukraine and learn how to kill, which so, is the absolute worst thing we want. Do you see parallels between them and the Mujahideen of Afghanistan, Absolutely. where the U.S., you know, supported the Mujahideen, gave them weapons, and then they turned those weapons on the United States? The same thing here. I mean, you've got this massive, unprecedented amount of weapons going into Ukraine right now. Uh, does Azov Battalion get them? Um, short story is yes. There's already been proof that they've gotten, for example, uh, uh, rifles, sniper rifles. There's proof that they've been getting training over the past— and this has been happening over the past eight years, while, you know, myself and others have been writing, saying, listen, this group needs to be taken care of. This group needs to be disbanded. This, it, it should not be uh, operational in Ukraine. All it does, it, it hurts Ukraine. And uh, so, yes, they have absolutely received training. They have absolutely received weapons. Um, and, and a lot of the times, unfortunately, the people who are training, and I've talked to some of the uh, the people who are training them on the ground, they, they don't know who's in Azov or not. They don't. A lot of the times, they don't come wearing T-shirts that say they're in Azov, and it just turns out that uh, later, when people look at social media and they figure out who's who, it turns out that yes, we do wind up training these people, and they, they've met, they've had people from NATO come over and train with them, and it's just, it, it's a horrible, it's a horrible look. It shouldn't be done. Support Ukraine. Don't support the 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 tiny part of it that happens to be an actual white supremacist battalion. Now, let me ask you about um, Putin reportedly appointing this new uh, general, Army General Alexander Dvornikov, to head the next phase of the war in Ukraine. Served in Chechnya in the 90s, 2015 became the first Russian commander uh, to lead military operations in Syria since 2016, has overseen the Southern Military District, which includes Crimea. Um, the Ukrainian peninsula seized by Russia in 2014. What do you know about him? I I know what everybody knows that they've been. This is this is a person who uh, takes a total war approach, for whom civilians are part of the war, and uh, who has certain uh, just utter lack of restraint and well, 
lack of restraint is a bad. He's shown just a willingness uh, and a uh, and a strategy that involves murdering civilians. So uh, the fact that he's on there and the fact that he has such a track record should tell you exactly what's in store for eastern Ukraine. Um, finally, if you can talk about what you think needs to happen right now, as you see, as you described it in your New York Times column, your country being erased. One is to put as much sanctions as you can. For eight years, the sanctions that have been put on Moscow have been have been extremely weak. It is only now that they're actually starting to do sanctions that hurt, because that's the problem with sanctions. The real sanctions, the ones that have an impact, also wind up hurting us. You know, there's a sacrifice that needs to be done, and that is the number one thing. And the number two thing is, as stupid as it sounds, if you if you've done everything you can, and if you're just sitting there, you don't know what to do. Okay. Learn a little bit about Ukraine, because Putin's entire premise and his entire war effort is to say that Ukraine doesn't exist. Ukraine is basically this backwards area of Russia that's just wayward and uh, and, and just, uh, you know, a bunch of peasants. OK, that and what he's trying to do is trying to say the Ukrainian language is not a language. It's really just a dialect. The, uh, the Ukrainian culture is not a culture. It's really just just a backward, backward uh, um, folklore. Learn a little bit about Ukraine, okay? If you, if you just are sitting there, you have nothing else to do, okay? Uh, learn about the culture. Learn about uh, they have these. We have these wonderful headdresses, for example, these gorgeous headdresses. The 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 national dress styles. Learn about the history. I mean, Kiev Rus was uh, an empire that had uh, trading from Scandinavia to Afghanistan. I mean, they were. They, it was this incredible first Slavic empire before Moscow was was known to anybody. Back when Moscow was just a, a pile of mud, um, Putin wants to erase Ukraine in an existential way. So, if you've donated, if you've called your member of Congress, if you've done everything else, if you've helped the refugee, you know what? Then, and if you have a little bit of time, if you want to, if you want to go against Putin, then learn a little bit about this culture, learn about this land. Lev Galenkin, I want to thank you for being with us. Ukrainian American journalists report extensively on the Ukraine crisis. We'll link to uh, your piece in the Times, author of A Backpack of Bear and Eight Crates of Vodka, a memoir of Soviet Ukraine. Next up, we look at a fund led by the Saudi Crown Prince that's invested two billion dollars in a private equity firm run by Donald Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Stay with us. Chalk by Alison Lorenzen. This is Democracy Now!, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The New York Times is reporting a fund led by the Saudi Crown Prince has invested $2 billion in Jared Kushner's new private equity firm. Kushner is the son-in-law and former top advisor to Donald Trump. While working in the White House, Kushner helped push forward a $110 billion weapons sale to Saudi Arabia. He also maintained close relations with the Saudi Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, even after MBS was accused of orchestrating the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in 2018. Public Citizen described the financial deal between Kushner and the Saudis as extremely troubling. The Saudi fund also invested a billion dollars in a fund run by Trump's Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin. This news comes 
has Turkey suspended the trial of 26 Saudi men accused of killing and dismembering Jamal Khashoggi? The suspects were being tried in absentia. Turkish officials say they'll now turn over the case to prosecutors in Saudi Arabia, just what the kingdom asked for. Human rights groups say that that will lead to a cover-up of the assassination plot, whose alleged masterminds, including Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, have not faced justice. To talk more about both stories, we're joined by Sarah Lee Whitson, executive director of Dawn, that's Democracy for the Arab World Now, a group founded by Jamal Khashoggi. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Sarah. It's great to have you with us. Can you start off by talking about the, um, the suspension of the trial in Turkey and moving it to Saudi Arabia? Uh, sure. Um, the suspension of the trial in Turkey is something that we were expecting and anticipated, given some remarks by Ibrahim Kalin, the advisor uh, to uh, uh, Erdogan in Turkey last year. Uh, it is part of a process of rapprochement that the Turkish government has been pursuing with Gulf states, uh, particularly the UAE and Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, in a particularly vulnerable situation where the Turkish economy is in free fall, uh, really doing everything they can to mend ties. Uh, of course, the main obstacle for Saudi ties with Turkey was the persistence of this trial. Uh, this is something that the Saudi government wanted to see wrapped up. Uh, and uh, Erdogan has delivered uh, by coming up with this pretense of moving the trial to Saudi Arabia, which has no meaning, given that they've already had a trial there. Uh, basically, the uh, Turkish government has decided that good relations, and in particular investment and trade with Saudi Arabia, is more important uh, than pursuing justice for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi on Turkish soil. And explain who these people are, by the way, and also the context that this is all happening in. I mean, clearly, um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, who's been accused uh, by U.S. authorities of personally masterminding this uh, murder, um, uh, according to the U.S. intelligence agencies, um, the context of this happening during the Russia's war in Ukraine. Um, well, I, I don't know if it really pertains to Russia's war in Ukraine. As I said, um, the Turkish government uh, made official statements last year uh, talking about possibly uh, ending the trial or moving the trial, although nothing happened. Uh, I believe this has been a process that has been underway since that time, uh, with the Turkish government finding, trying to find the quietest way uh, to move that trial, possibly the Ukraine conflict. Uh, is a massive global distraction, so there's less attention on Turkey's abandonment of the trial uh, in Turkey than there might otherwise be. Um, but the really important development uh, was uh, President Erdogan's travel uh, to the UAE uh, to secure further investments. Uh, he was supposed to visit Riyadh in February at the same time. That didn't happen uh, because the trial was still outstanding. Uh, late last year, uh, the UAE injected massive amounts of cash into Turkey's failing economy and committed to massive investments going forward. Um, the UAE uh, is uh, uh, really just saving the Turkish economy, has saved the Turkish economy. Um, this is very clear in terms of the Turkish government's approach to our rapprochement uh, with all of the axis of authoritarians uh, in the region, including Egypt, uh, as a result of which there has been a real crackdown on the Egyptian exile population uh, inside Turkey, uh, as well as a rapprochement with Israel. Uh, and so, really, I think this was the main thorn standing uh, in terms of Turkey being able to reestablish good relations, profitable relations with Saudi Arabia. And, of course, the courting of Saudi Arabia right now for its oil, as uh, the world tries to get away from Russian oil and gas, is a key time for Saudi Arabia to make demands uh, in exchange. Absolutely. And Turkey's not the only government that uh, uh, MBS is making demands on. Uh, MBS has also made demands that he be given immunity from prosecution in the United States from our lawsuit with Khadija Cengiz, 
as well as two other lawsuits uh, pending against him, uh, including against Saleh al-Jabri uh, for his attempted murder of Saleh al-Jabri. Um, and so right now, uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, is reportedly holding uh, oil output and the price of global oil hostage uh, to uh, his uh, escape from prosecution, his escape from uh, justice in the United States. Uh, it's really a terrifying example of the export of authoritarianism to our country, uh, where uh, he has no problem asking for an intervention in our judicial system uh, in order to swap increased oil output. And it is not easy for the Biden administration uh, to deal with what is increased leverage by the Saudi government because of the crisis in oil output and oil prices right now. I wanted to also ask you about the New York Times piece, Top Story, published Monday, that describes how a fund led by the Saudi crown prince has invested $2 billion in Jared Kushner, uh, his new private equity firm, despite objections from the fund's advisors about the merits of the deal. And they weren't only objections. They talked about um, the inexperience of the affinity fund management, uh, the bulk of the investment and risk. Uns they said uh, due diligence on the fledgling firm's operations found them unsatisfactory in all aspects. Um, so the advisors said no, and then when the whole Saudi sovereign fund met, uh, MBS overruled them. Can you talk about the significance of giving $2 billion to the president's senior advisor, um, former president Donald Trump and son-in-law, as well as $1 billion uh, to Steven Mnuchin? I would say it exposes the uh, corruption and lack of accountability in both uh, the American system and the Saudi system. Uh, in the Saudi system, I think it's very significant that the board members found a way to leak uh, the information, to reveal the information about their objections to uh, this investment in a very rare display of challenge to MBS, uh, basically it probably just covering their own butts uh, in terms of their anticipation that this investment will fail and making clear that they did not want this to happen, um, that basically this is Jared Kushner's slush fund uh, that MBS is depositing funds to. Uh, in what must be probably the most expensive payoff uh, for covering up the murder of Jamal Khashoggi uh, here in the United States. And, and the evidence of the cover-up uh, was openly discussed uh, by uh, none other than President Trump. Uh, we all know that Jared Kushner had very close ties to MBS uh, and indeed leaked uh, the names of Saudis uh, who had been in meetings with U.S. government officials, uh, endangering them uh, and uh, preceding the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, so this is something that Jared Kushner has been involved in for a while. Uh, in terms of our own country, it's really just appalling. Uh, that there could be such a massive payoff for a former government official uh, by a foreign government whose interests uh, MBS, I'm rather, Kushner, was very, very uh, handily representing uh, here when he was in the United States. It speaks to a glaring lack of conflict of interest rules that should prohibit business dealings by former government officials, uh, services, or employment uh, by former government officials uh, to foreign governments after their work. It just creates a massive conflict of interest. Uh, and clearly, the fact that this fund uh, has just come into existence uh, with the fact that there's no experience on Kushner's side for running any kind of fund, and yet it gets billions of dollars from one principal investor, uh, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, it just reeks. Uh, and really what it demands is a congressional investigation about everything that transpired before this fund was set up and everything that's happening now. Uh, we should say uh, our guest, Sarah Lee Whitson, is not only ahead of Dawn, but she has filed a lawsuit uh, on behalf of the fiancé of, um, of Khashoggi uh, that alleges MBS and his co-conspirators ordered the abduction, torture, murder, dismemberment and disappearance of Khashoggi, the lawsuit seeking relief under the Alien Tort Claims Act and the Torture Victim Protection Act uh, for Khashoggi's murder. 
Um, we spoke about that earlier, and folks can go to democracynow.org. But I wanted to end by asking you about the news out of Yemen. The U.N. brokered two-month truce in Yemen. Now, in its second week, the U.S.-backed Saudi-led coalition and Houthi rebels both agreed to halt all offensive operations inside Yemen across its borders. Can you talk about the latest and the significance of this? Uh, well, first of all, it is a tremendously positive development. This is the first truce uh, for over the past six years, uh, and so far it's held. It's a time-bound truce of two months, um, and it's almost a complete truce. And I say almost because while uh, the guns are quiet, um, the siege of uh, Yemen has not stopped. The Saudi-led coalition's blockade uh, of uh, the entire country, air, land, sea, has not stopped. Uh, while there have been some agreements to allow some limited flights into Sana'a, which is great, and some limited fuel shipments into Houthi-controlled areas, which is very important, uh, overall the siege remains. Uh, domestically, it will remain to be seen whether this attempt by uh, the international community, the UN, to establish a new government structure. President Hadi has turned over his executive powers uh, to a new government structure that includes uh, basically every party to the conflict inside the country, except for the Houthis, uh, in an attempt to bring them together uh, to, uh, um, I suppose, defeat the Houthis once and for all. Whether that will hold uh, remains to be seen. Uh, I think uh, we all have to realize that the Houthis will have to be part of any negotiated settlement in the country, uh, and excluding them, uh, as they represent certainly a sizable minority in the country, uh, will not be a recipe for success. Uh, nevertheless, this is a tremendously important respite for the Yemeni people uh, from bombs and, and, and weapons that have been devastating them for the past uh, over six years. Sarah Leewitz, I want to thank you for this update on these issues. Executive Director of Democracy for the Arab World Now, or DAWN. Next up, Pandemic Inc., chasing the capitalists and the thieves who got rich while we got sick. Back in 30 seconds. by Flügen. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's show with ProPublica investigative reporter J. David McSwain. His new book is out today. It's called Pandemic, Inc., Chasing the Capitalists and Thieves Who Got Rich While We Got Sick. This week, Dave wrote a viral Twitter thread about the book that began let me tell you a crazy story. It's consumed two years of my life. As COVID-19 shut down the world in April 2020, I decided to follow the money. I began with a call to a no-name federal contractor who'd somehow landed a $35 million deal for masks. Hours later, I'm on a private jet. Again, those are the words of J. David McSwain. Welcome to Democracy Now! Congratulations on the publication of your book today. So take us from there. Why did you go on that private jet? Uh, so these were the early weeks of the pandemic, late April, early May 2020. Really scary times. No vaccine, masks in short supply, our hospitals overrun. And this contractor, who I had found in federal purchasing data, had really come out of nowhere and had a really sizable deal that stood out. Uh, but in addition to that, he was supplying supposedly six million masks to the Veterans Administration, which oversees the largest hospital network in the country. So he had a pretty vital role in our pandemic response. And just sort of doing the due diligence, I, I wondered how he got this deal. And and called him, and he, and he ended up uh, saying I could tag along in this private jet. And in doing so, over the co course of maybe 72 hours, flying first to Georgia and then to Chicago, realized that you know, he didn't have any masks. Uh, he claimed that they were, you know, bought out from under him. Uh, next, he had a new line on masks. It involved some interesting characters. And slowly but surely, as I'm sort of observing this, I, I began to wonder if the whole thing was made up, uh, and if, in fact, he had 
you know, conspired to to defraud the federal government. And, you know, we didn't know everything then, but this was really crucial information that I felt the, the American public needed to know. So we reported what we knew, and that really set me off on more than a year of reporting following around not just federal contractors, but people who entered this space, sort of seeing the chaos cascading down from the federal government through states and into cities. And, you know, just over and over found these just sort of bizarre characters doing odd things and really just trying to take advantage of our national emergency. So what, what happened with Robert Stewart? I mean, he didn't get this money alone. He was given this money by the U.S. government. And what happened to the masks? Well, I should clarify, he hadn't been given the money outright. The federal government, unlike some states, was you know, was under the uh, working under the idea that, well, we'll just hand out contracts all over the place and uh, we'll pay if stuff is delivered, uh, which which they said was, you know, sort of no, no harm, no foul. But what they were doing was they were flooding these big contracts into this market full of brokers and investors and everyone. And they're seeing, well, the federal government's willing to pay six dollars for a mask that used to cost one dollar. Uh, so while he didn't collect any money because he ultimately didn't deliver any masks, and was ultimately charged uh, on on three counts of fraud. Others did get paid for the delivery of subpar equipment at times. Uh, sometimes you know, I have one example in Pandemic Inc. the the book of uh, a contractor who who stood up a company and by the end of the week had a sizable deal with with the Federal Emergency Management Agency to deliver test tubes. Those test tubes were not, in fact, test tubes. They were mini soda bottles that had been uh, sort of rounded up with literal shovels by temp workers in a hot and unsterile warehouse in Houston. <laughs> and uh, the federal government ended up accepting those and, and paying this vendor, even though those, those uh, non-test tube test tubes were completely unusable. So there was an array of, of folks who entered this space, some of whom managed to get paid, some of whom didn't, and and some of whom ended up dealing with law enforcement. But I want to play a short video you recorded and are sharing now for yeah. the first time. When you stopped by Philiket's warehouse outside of Houston, Texas, on June 10th, 2020, again, right. a few months into the pandemic, you later reported on how this company got a $10 million FEMA contract for test tubes but gave them mini soda bottles instead. In this video, you approach the warehouse's loading dock after the garage door opens. You can see workers inside holding shovels and tiny soda bottles. Then Paul Wexler, wearing an Astros T-shirt, shouts at you to leave. As you respond, Wexler slams the door shut. This is a clip. Yeah, I'm trying to talk to Mr. Wexler. I'm not on your property. I'm not on your property. Are these sterile vials you have here? How are you sterilizing these vials, sir? Are these sterile? So can you describe what happened next and what was inside, actually? Sure. Uh, yeah, that wasn't exactly how I wanted to approach that story. I'm not, I, you know, I'm not in um, in TV and, and don't love the theatrics, but I, I realized that I needed some evidence to back up what we were hearing from sources. So I turned on my cell phone, I accidentally took it upside down. I'm holding my notepad, my pen, I'm putting on my mask. So it was a little bit chaotic, but I was able to, see, to observe and, and to document that, you know, this was a warehouse, nondescript, the only indication that the company was there was a low stock piece of paper with some clip art on it. And, you know, these workers, some of them wearing masks, some not, were rounding up these soda bottles with literal shovels, moving them from one bin to another. Some were squirting in saline, uh, which was sort of a, it, it's not the buffer you'd like to see in this sort of test kit, which is the PCR test, the real deal test that we were really needing at the time. I mean, we our, our national response was was incredibly behind. Testing was a huge part of that. And seeing that none of the protocols you need for those sort of tests, including a refrigerated truck, they, instead they had a rented enterprise truck, none of those things are being followed. So these were highly suspect tubes, and they were being sent to FEMA, which was forwarding them to all 50 states and territories. So Having that video for me seemed important. I needed to say that these particular tubes were the product being delivered and they matched what we were seeing from public health officials in, in various states.
So, ultimately, what happened? Ultimately, what happened is because the federal government, FEMA, accepted those those soda bottles filled with saline as a, you know, as per their contract and delivered them to states, contract ex experts we talked to said it, it'd be hard to make a case that the federal government didn't get what they paid for because they accepted them and they were forwarded to many states. And I talked to public health officials who said this set back their testing plan. It set them back weeks. Uh, the, the tubes, in addition to probably being unsterile, they didn't fit standard lab equipment. I mean, this would not have been hard to catch by any public health official because the states noticed it right away. No one wanted these things, but the company was paid. And uh, to my knowledge, there's been no law enforcement action in response to that particular deal, though the owner uh, has, is facing some lawsuits related to uh, other allegations of fraud. So can you talk about the respirator deal with Airbus Defense Group that was directly ordered by the White House? You found that the key Trump advisor, very much in the news right now, um, referred by the Committee for Criminal um, Prosecution, Peter Navarro, awarded the deal to Airbus after it hired retired four-star Army General John Keane to reach out to him shortly after Trump had awarded Keane the Medal of Freedom. Right. In the book, Peter Navarro, in, in my research, he, he sort of stood out to me as a bit of a tragic figure. He was one of few in the administration who really took the threat seriously early on. And, you know, and he's got bravado. He's brusque and uh, kind of, uh, you know, a no BS kind of guy in the White House. He wanted to take charge in what he called Trump time. Uh, when, at the same time, the administration was trying to ignore the pandemic altogether. So behind the scenes, he does something really remarkable. He, he takes federal government purchasing into his own hands. And for obvious reasons, you can't have political appointees in, in a political office, the White House, deciding who gets, you know, multimillion dollar deals and who doesn't. And this is this was sort of the first indication that I found. And I, and I found it in just like an obscure entry in federal data that the White House was ordering these deals. And this particular company uh, is a real company, Canadian uh, controlled company, ultimately. Uh, you know, they, they produce rubber products. And these were for those sort of high end respirators you saw with like Dustin Hoffman wearing an outbreak. And, you know, uh, they, got a, they got a pretty large deal. And we noticed that the White House was ordering it. And that was sort of our first indication that. I think, you know, we think the federal response right now is to just throw money all over the place. And if you have some political connections, that helps. Uh, but I found weeks later that it, you, you didn't even need that. You just needed an LLC and an email and the federal government would give you a deal uh, for things that you may or may not have. And again, uh, to clarify, we're talking about Air Boss, um, not Airbus. Uh, but uh, right. David, finally, if you can talk about what this all means, I mean, we're not done with this pandemic yet, and also the billions of dollars that were spent. Right. I, I mean, it, it's fair to assume from the outset that we were going to spend a lot of money. We we weren't prepared. We needed to find supplies. Uh, healthcare workers were in danger and dying. So you expect some of that. But I was really struck by how chaotic it was. You know, even though this was the Trump administration, I expected there to be some inertia just within the government bureaucracy to ensure that we were buying real things and we were getting a decent deal and and we weren't wasting our time with with con men and found that it, it, we were so flat footed so ill prepared our national stockpile had something like 1% of what we needed to address you know really that first wave of the pandemic that's how bad it was that our national well-being really rested in the hands of these mercenaries who who smelled blood in the water and 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 really sought riches uh, so I, I view the book as a blueprint of, of exactly what not to do and sort of a call to better prepare so that we're not in this situation again. Uh, but, but, but more than that, I, you know, I'm conscious that, you know, we're all feeling pan pandemic fatigue and, and we'd love to move on. I, I, I sort of looked through the lens the whole time in writing the book and, and in my reporting to answer the question, what, what, is, what does this mean about us? Uh, and, and at the end of the day, while the book is an artifact of the pandemic, I think it's really a story about who we are, our worst impulses, what happens when we just sort of have this religious adherence to 
pre-markets uh, when experts say we really should have had a very visible hand on this and directed supplies and figured out who needed things and, and made sure that our money was, was being used wisely. Well, J. David McSwain, I want to thank you for being with us. Investigative reporter with ProPublica, new book out today, Pandemic Inc., Chasing the Capitalists and Thieves Who Got Rich While We Got Sick. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining